And greetings, everyone. Welcome to Room 42. I'm Liz Fraley from Single Sourcing Solutions. I'm your moderator. This is Jana Summers from TC Camp. She's our interviewer. And welcome to Sean Williams, today's guest in Room 42. Sean Williams, PhD, is a professor and chair of the Technical Communication and Information Design Department at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. TCID is the only standalone technical communication department in Colorado and it currently partners with major companies on projects ranging from user experience design, to cybersecurity research, to designing professional development courses in engineering writing. His research has taken many forms over the, year, the years, beginning with information architecture in complex web environments to social media in technology startups and user experience design in 3D virtual reality. Most recently, his work is focused on user experience design and environmental communication, where his central focus is understanding how to best communicate science to drive personal conservation behaviors and public policy changes. His new book, Technical Communication for Environmental Action, is due out in the fall of this year. I hope that date is still on. Yes? It is. It is. Excellent. He's going to investigate. He is already investigating the question in detail and presents essays from 12 notable scholars who write about the intersection of environmental communication, science, and social justice. In addition to this work in the academic sector, he's been a founder or co-founder of four technology startup companies. He's consulted extensively with industry clients on a range of projects that include electronic healthcare records, intranet redesign, corporate training design, and usability assessments of mobile security software. Today, he's here to help us start answering the question, how does technical communication connect issues of social justice, environmental justice, with respect to how we use, allocate, and access water in particular? Welcome. Wow, that's quite an introduction. Um... I'm winded just listening to it. How do you find the time? I get better. I know, right? You know, sometimes I wonder. I'm, I'm tired a lot, I think. I can see why. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's been great. You know, I've had, I've had a great career doing a lot of different things. Yes. And I've, I've been really fortunate to work with a lot of really good people. And, you know, I think Liz, the response to, or, or Janice, the response to how do you do all that? is you surround yourself with really awesome people and you trust them to do good work. And, and so while, you know, maybe I can take credit for a lot of that stuff and the publications and so on, there's a whole lot of people who contributed. So it's not just me. So right. to be clear. It takes a village, right? It, it does. Absolutely, it does. Yeah. So let's talk about um, water conservation and technical communications and how that ties together. So. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, actually, just yesterday, in fact, I submitted a report to um, the Colorado Springs Utilities. Colorado mm -hmm. Springs Utilities is working on something called direct potable reuse. Direct potable reuse is basically recycled water. And in Southern mm -hmm. California, for example, they're, they're doing this where we need to do it in most of the Southwest. And what we did was they did a, a, a program, um, mm -hmm. an outreach program, about communicating the science of DPR, direct potable reuse. Mm -hmm. And what we did is we studied, you know, we, we studied, we designed and studied the impact of different materials, you know, pre and post. And so people would come, they would tour our pilot plant, they would, um, you know, they would interact with some materials and we change those up and we would kind of see what would happen. And so the, the core there is how do we take this science because it is very technical yeah, and it's right. proven science of recycling water to help um, demonstrate and persuade people that it's safe because there's a certain yuck factor, right? People right. In, in Southern California, it failed because they used this, you know, phrase toilet to tap. Oh, that's, that's bad that's communication, right? And so obviously we didn't do that. Oh. And, and so that's, that's a very concrete example. And so we did surveys, we did, you know, qualitative analysis of commentary on mm -hmm. the different communication pieces that we had. And then that now is, is generating the next iteration of how Colorado Springs Utilities is going to communicate about direct potable reuse. And so that's one concrete example where TechCon can work with, in this case, a public utility mm -hmm. to drive conservation behaviors in the general public. Right, because understanding the end user, the customer, is right. 
the cornerstone in technical communication is the advocate for the end user, the learner, right? right. So understanding and, their motivation. Go ahead. Yeah, and I was going to say one of the one of the challenges that we have had in this project is Colorado Springs is a very diverse community, mm -hmm. and there are lots of folks who don't trust anything that comes from the public sector. Right. Um, and one of our challenges moving ahead is how do we interact with and how do we engage different populations? You know, we have a huge military right. population, for example, who are mm -hmm. a lot of times suspicious of government. And how do we, how do we interact with them? We have a huge um, Hispanic population. Mm -hmm. And how do we interact with them? We have a Korean population. How do we interact with them? Because everybody thinks about Flint, Michigan, whenever we're talking about water, and they yes. think, oh, well, the people yeah. who are in disadvantaged communities are going to get this recycled water while the people up on the west side of Colorado Springs are going to get the good stuff. Right. Which is, which is of course, not mm. true. It's all the same system. And, and that's a challenge for us is how do we communicate to those diverse audiences? Because it is a it's, it's something that everybody in the community needs to be engaged with. And how do we how do we do that? So that's a yes, we need to we need to design for different types of audiences, not just the college educated professional engineer types. Right. Who understand this stuff. Right. You have to actually you have to have like several different campaign so you get other cultures involved in creating yeah. messaging how do you do that say that one more time very different culturally different groups right um one of the things that we're looking at actually worked in san antonio or not san antonio in el paso so mm -hmm. el paso texas is as a they're going to be doing full-scale recycled water in mm -hmm. wow. um, 2025 and what they've done this book was really successful is that they basically deputized their employees and trained them mm -hmm. and mentored those employees and sent those employees out in the community because the population of the folks who work in, in El Paso and the water utility there right. represent the community. Right. And, and so rather than sending out people from the utility to talk at people, these are, these are folks who are working in their own community. And mm -hmm. that's a, that's a really, that, that, at least in El Paso, that seems to have been effective. And um, so yeah. I think that's something that's going that I'm talking with Colorado Springs about. Well, and I can see how there would be a lot more trust, right? Because these are people, sure, they work for the utility, but they're members of that community. They live in that community and they understand that community. Right. So that third factor in technical communication, that third most important factor is believability and trust. They have that, right? Right, right. And it's, it's, you know, trust when you're talking about something as fundamental as water mm -hmm. is coming. I mean, it is, is absolutely central. Mm -hmm. And a challenge that's happened here, not just in Colorado Springs, but in Colorado more generally, is that we've done a really good job with conservation. And folks don't yet believe that there's a problem. You know, because I'm, you know, I can go to my kitchen and I can turn on my tap right. and the water's still there. And so it's not a real problem. And, and so part of the trust building is helping people to understand that this is a 20 year horizon. Yes. And, you know, most of us don't think about a problem, no. you know, 20 years in the future. And, mm -hmm. you know, in order to, in order to make this real, you know, we have to build infrastructure. We have to, there's a, there's a long time frame on this. And just persuading people that, in fact, there that is a happened. problem. Yeah, that that there's a problem. Yes. That, that's so true. Like, that's one of the, yeah. I think, one of the biggest challenges is anything social justice or environmental is helping people understand that, yes, you can turn on your light switch and you get electricity, you can drive your car. And, but these are limited resources that we need to protect and conserve and how to build that in people so that they understand the need for action is now. You know, and interestingly, to, to bring the book in a little bit, um, there are actually two, two chapters in this book that talk about this issue. Um, mm -hmm. One is about flood insurance in the, in the coastal part of um, Virginia. Okay. And the, one of, that, this, this author is talking yeah. about how do you, you know, it's, it's the opposite problem that what we have here in the West is they have too much water and sea rise and sea level rise. 
And so how do you persuade people to purchase flood insurance to protect their homes or to rebuild their homes and to create more resilient communities? And, you know, that chapter is about something as, I mean, it's as mundane as how do you design the, the web-based system to make these complex flood tables that um, the federal government and FEMA put out comprehensible to average people so that they can see this, so yeah. they can go online and there's a calculator. It's like, oh, if I live in this neighborhood then and I have this type of a house, then my flood insurance rates are going to be X. And that's a really simple thing conceptually to do, but mm -hmm. it was very technically, it was very difficult. And there was a lot of very complex information that went into building the system. And, you know, and so that was, that's, an, it's the same kind of a problem where you're, you know, building a system, building a communication product to build trust, to drive action that's ultimately going to help people. But actually what you're doing is you're helping them see that there is actually something you need to do. Um, another chapter is actually about mid, the Midwest and Iowa and um, large scale agriculture. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the, the exigence there was a little bit easier because the water, the water table was the rivers are being polluted by, you know, chemical, chemical runoff from farms. From the farms, yeah. And um, it was a, it, it's an interesting chapter because, you know, when, we're, when we hear about environmental justice and we, when we think about environmental action, we often don't think about Midwestern farmers. We think about fires in California or floods in, in the Carolinas or um, drought in Colorado. But in fact, the, the Midwest and Midwestern farmers are, are facing the same issues. I mean, mm -hmm. all of our issues are different, but the issues of climate and climate um, justice or environmental justice are just as relevant for them. And so how do um, farm cooperatives work with, um, for example, water utilities to clean the water so that the water doesn't go down, so the chemicals don't get, go downstream and there were some lawsuits and so this particular, this particular chapter was talking about how technical communicators can get involved in the, the process of agricultural communication. So things like the agricultural field day, something that was completely new to me. I'm not from a farm community. Mm -hmm. You know, this is literally inviting people to the field, I mean, to a, to a oh, field wow. and you, education of, of farmers about better techniques mm -hmm. and better ways that they can um, work in their fields. And there was a project called STRIPS, for example, and STRIPS is taking parts of your, your um, farmable land mm -hmm. and making it, re restoring it to the natural environment. Because what happens then is those, not the natural vegetation, more in low-lying areas and more swampy areas, the vegetation absorbs the chemicals, but so right. it doesn't run off. And so as a consequence, you don't have to use it, or you, you, you don't have to um, remediate the soil. Mm -hmm. So, and it's, and it's what was interesting in that particular chapter is the farmers were talking about this is the best part of their farm now because they have these, you know, vegetation strips, these sort of natural vegetation That's prairie correct. strips yeah. all throughout their farm. And it's not just row farming or crop, row crop farming. So, anyway, the point is demonstrating to people that there is a problem is a challenge and until there's a fire in your neighborhood or a flood on your street mm -hmm. it's difficult to do that that's true when we're comfortable it's hard for us to understand that there's a problem mm -hmm. right there is. It and is. unfortunately some people you know are faced with that uncomfort and that disaster that wakes them up yes and you know as Good. a I'm sorry. So I was, um, something just popped, the agricultural field day, is that, uh, and I assume there are like community action groups and um, nonprofits all involved in all of these kinds of programs, right? Correct. Some time um, ago, we had Aaron Carlson from West Virginia yeah. talk about going to TechCon communicators, and especially those who are new or want to expand their portfolio, to go to these sort of volunteer groups and volunteer services that tech come to a group that doesn't even know they need it. Yeah. This seems like a great place to go. And you it, found it, another one. It, it yeah. is. And of course the challenge is 
the the farming communities in particular they're pretty they're pretty tight yes and and, and right you know, there's and so how do you how do you penetrate that and so what this particular article is talking about is as a technical communicator if you seek to um begin working in that environment you have to understand the role of the radio shows right the role of the map the role of these agricultural field days, you have to understand how the agricultural community works because functions, yeah. That's different from the tech sector, right? They're mm-hmm. they're not the mm-hmm. same. And the 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 community of agriculture and, and farmers in the Midwest is really well established. And you know, to, to work into that environment requires understanding the context. And the local, the local wisdom, and the local practices, and that I think also is um, is a key feature. Again, talking about the book, one of the key themes in the book is local knowledge. Yep. And and the value of local knowledge, because a lot of times in in technical communication, like with what I'm doing here in Colorado mm-hmm. Springs, is communicating the science mm-hmm. of recycled water, but a lot of times the science doesn't matter. It's the story or right. it's the community or it's local right. practices or it's indigenous, indigenous knowledges. And, you know, if we, if we think about, you know, just sort of in our own practical experience, mm-hmm. your embodied knowledge, mm-hmm. you know, where you, where you live, yeah. um, you know that it's really cold because your nose starts to run. You don't know that it's you know thirty four degrees, but you know that it's pretty cold, right? Uh, right. And you know the the importance of that the importance of that type of local knowledge, and not not subordinating it to scientific knowledge and having it be yes. an equal partner, is is really essential because there's a lot of people who know a lot of yeah. stuff, and yeah, they, they, don't really, speak it, they don't necessarily speak it in a scientific way. No, no. Right. And, and yet you can, you can, they don't know how to talk to the other side nearly as well. That communication is, is stilted and almost people get offended on both sides. Correct. Correct. And, and I think one of, one of the chapters in this book that I hope everybody reads the first chapter yeah. by, by um, an Inuit scholar now at Virginia Tech, Kena mm-hmm. um, it, she makes a very, really, really good case she has these tables where, where she'll lay out, okay, um, when in our language, if we don't greet people by saying it's cold, we'll say it's so cold that I, you know, my breath froze, or I can hear my breath freezing, or, you know, there are all of these different um, phrases, and, or she's talking about ice, you know, and going hunting on ice, and the, the types of ice, and if a type of ice can hold a snowmobile, a sled, and two riders, right. and a seal, right. then that's safe ice. They don't know that it's you know four or six inches or what type of ice it is, but you can quantify that. And so the science can yeah. come in and they can drill a core and they can say that this is this type of ice. But the local knowledges can look at the ice, can jump on the ice, and know that it's safe ice it's like, yes, I know that this is safe ice. I don't need <laughs> to drill a core to tell me that it's safe ice. And so right. that's, a, that's, really, that's a very specific example. But that whole chapter is about the importance of, of local knowledge and how local knowledge needs to, needs to collaborate or coordinate or be equal to scientific yeah. knowledge. Right. And it's like you have to do a translation, a running translation, but coming from not the science perspective, but from the local knowledge perspective. Right. Because you can say this is safe ice. So in the native language, they'll understand safe ice. They know what that means. And you can then translate into what the scientific version of it is. It means that it's 24 inches deep. But, you know, and then you can go on with, you know, whatever you need to convey the message. But I think you need to start with a local knowledge person speaking in that local language. Because that yes. embraces them, pulls them in and lets them know you understand them. You know, and one of the things that supposedly we all do in TechCom is we think about the users or the audiences first, right? Right. And, and that's so- our goal. If, That's our goal. That's our goal. <laughs> that's our goal. <laughs> and, if, and if we're genuinely doing that, 
then it makes a lot of sense to talk to the people, the farmers or the Inuit peoples or, you know, the firefighters or whoever. It's like, what do you know? What do you know about this, yeah. about yeah. this topic? Because, and how, how can we help you achieve your goals? Because a lot of times, like, like, again, I'll come back to, to, to recycled water in Colorado Springs. Um, if we, if we, when we talk to people in the community, it's not valued. It's not, it's not something that people care about. So right. on one hand, because people don't care mm -hmm. about it, or it's not something that's part of their consciousness, mm -hmm. it's not a problem that they think needs to be solved. So circling back. And so maybe we should be asking, what is the problem Colorado Springs citizens that you think we should solve with water? Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. And so as I'm talking through this, I'm thinking, you know, maybe I should, you know, talk to my folks at Colorado Springs Utilities and see if they like the farmhouse. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's like Treat people yeah. like the farmers. Yeah. What do you want us to solve? With and water. of course, yeah. people will say we want the water to be cheap and good. Mm -hmm. You know, but beyond that, who knows? But that's you know, that's a corollary to local knowledge is, is mm -hmm. how yeah. what are the problems that you person in the world need need to have solved because I can come in, I can say, Oh, we need to solve this, this, and this, and this, but maybe those things aren't problems that you care about or are meaningful to you. So you're not going to be interested if I solve those problems. Right. Cause if my problem is I just want to make sure I've got a cheap water bill. Yeah. Right. Then yeah. that's all I'm focused on. If my water bill is not going up, I'm fine. So, you know, if that's my problem, then, then, then you know that, okay, well, to communicate the necessity of this or the importance of it, the significance is that I need to communicate this in a way that they understand it's going to be holding their costs low, right? right. So I know, it's, you know, we can get around all this other stuff, but we need to lead with lowering your cost or keeping your costs low. And this is how we plan to solve it, right? So that's kind of what you're saying. Well, and, and the quality of the water. Yeah. Well, yeah. Quality. Right. Well, uh, right. But if I'm just assuming mm -hmm. quality is going to be there. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> there are standards. And, you know, uh, um, speaking about environmental justice issues and water in particular, one of the challenges also is legislation policy mm -hmm. hasn't caught up. And, yeah. and, and so when we're thinking about recycled water, there's two types of recycled water. For those of you out in the world who are interested, there's indirect potable reuse and there's potable reuse. Indirect potable reuse is already quite extensively used. And so basically um, wastewater comes in, it's treated, it's discharged, it's cleaned to a standard that's higher than any river or stream that it's discharged into. It's almost potable right. again. It's released into a stream. It flows three miles down a stream. It's pulled out again. It's treated for drinking water and it's put back into the system. That's indirect, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay. and then direct potable is when the, the wastewater comes in, it's treated to drinking water standards and then reintroduced into the system without, without this. Without, out, without having to rewild the water. <laughs> exactly, rewild the water. <laughs> and, you know, people are okay with the, with the wild water, even though. Isn't that funny? Even though it's dirtier right? after it flows yeah. down the river than when it was released into the river. And so it's an interesting thing because, but they're pulling it out of a stream. So somehow that makes it better. And anybody who's ever spent a lot of time outside, I, I'm a mountaineer. And so I spend a lot of time up in these mountains and in the woods yeah. and, you know, water can be pretty nasty in the wild. Yes. <laughs> and, when, you're, when you're in the wild, you see what goes into that water sometimes. Right. And, you know, it's and I was, I was in South America once and um, in Peru and, you gotta be really careful because there's a lot of farm activity that's upstream and there's crypto, it, it, there's a, a bacterium that can get into the water that's pretty nasty. Yeah. Um, anyway, so, so back to what I was gonna say, that has to do with policy and regulation. So indirect potable reuse is more um, acceptable because states mm. and local governments have introduced policies, regulations to make sure that that water is um, clean because the Clean Water Act, the Federal Clean Water Act, ensures the water coming out of a wastewater treatment plant is, is treated to a certain standard 
and then the water going back into the into the system is treated to a certain standard. So mm-hmm. it's it's easier in that way. But the legislation and the policy for direct potable reuse doesn't exist in most states. And so and so in Colorado, for example, one of the challenges is persuading state legislators that we need to create regulation and policy on this water or on direct potable reuse water so that we can then implement DPR or recycled water processes and procedures. And, um, but without the regulation, it, you can't really do it except at, at a pilot scale. Right. And then the, and, and if it's regulated, this is the irony, right? If it's regulated, people will think, okay, then it's better. Even though that it's already federally regulated, in any drinking water is federally regulated, it has to be treated to this, to this certain standard coming right. out of a plant. So whether it's direct potable, indirect potable, a it native matter, water, right? it's always going to come out of the plant to the same standard. But local local um, water legislation that's governed by states hasn't caught up yet with you taking, you know, moving the water from the wastewater system back into the potable water system. And that's a local issue. Um, Florida is dealing with the same issue. Texas has kind of solved it. Texas is a little bit more of a wild, wild west, <laughs> no pun intended, um, <laughs> on, on, you know, things that, things that um, can happen there. Um, I have a conversation I'm really excited about next week with Singapore. Mm-hmm. Singapore has been doing this for 20 years, direct potable reuse. Direct potable water, yeah. Yeah. And, oh. um, you know, so the, the crazy thing is that the science, is the, the science is there and the science is old. The science, yeah. The, the um, in fact, the, the, the analogy that in El Paso, going back to El Paso again, the story that they've told in El Paso that persuaded people to that this is okay, is it's exactly the same technology that, bottled water companies use to treat water you know i was gonna gonna say earlier when you were talking about the stream i'm like you know because i think about you know a lot of the bottled water companies and they kind of mislead people because they show pictures of a stream with running water so it gives that connection that oh it's safe as the stream water right Right. which is from the stream (laughs) you and i you know those of us who who, you know gone out into the wild we know fresh from the stream no that's not so good right Right. Okay. Uh, there's a question over there. Have I, ever, have I ever encountered someone using living machine technology as a sewage treatment option? I don't know what that is. So I'm going to say no. Thanks for the question. Um, you know, living machine technology. So are we talking about bioorganisms introduced into the wastewater treatment? I don't know. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, and so the, the bioorganisms is, are usually introduced into wastewater, and if you go to a, I encourage everybody to go to a wastewater treatment plant, because it's, it's super cool, um, you know, because there's mechanical um, yes. treatment so, where, yeah. where solids are stripped off, mm-hmm. and then there's um, bioorganisms that are introduced to the water, there's aeration, there's chemical treatments, so all of that works, and so um, partly it depends upon what the what the sec in my understanding is that the wastewater and use of bioorganisms that you know eat basically um, other organisms or, or bad organisms in the water mm-hmm. that that's a big part of of sewage treatment. I know that it is here in Colorado Springs, but I think sort of just that's kind of a standard practice. But aeration, sunlight, you know, um, ozone. Mm-hmm. chemical treatment, mechanical treatment. I think all of those things get used. Yeah, well, I know all, those things, all right. those things get used yeah. in wastewater treatment right, to get right. to restore wastewater. We like to use wastewater, not sewage, right? Wastewater is a, is a, is a kinder word. It's more friendly to say wastewater, <laughs> right? Yeah, so, um, so I'm not sure I'm answering your question, Leanna, but my takeaway, maybe my takeaway from the experience is that the, the bioorganisms are part of a, a larger complex system that's required to treat wastewater. That's, that's my big, that's my big takeaway um, from that. 
Well, and bioorganisms are used a lot in cleanup projects as well. Correct. Uh, all kinds of different things, oil spills, all kinds of things, bioorganisms are the preferred thing to use, right? Right. But the whole thing here is, we're, you know, back to communicating to, 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 to people, how are they going to go from, you know, sewage wastewater <laughs> to embracing it as something I can drink, you know, nice, fresh, clean glass of water. And the role that technical communication or technical communicators can play in that. And water is one example. There's, I'm sure, other examples of, of environmental, um, environmental things that technical communicators can be involved in and trying to bridge that gap between science because the science is really, really important, but I think it's lost on a lot of people because it's, it's, when you think about the things that the average person has to care about, you know, how much do they value the, the science? Like, do they have time to really understand the science? And I think one of the, one of the challenges that we face now is there's a certain mistrust of science in the United States. There's a mistrust and of a lot of things, science, yeah. Expertise, right? Yes. And um, legislators, I mean, there's a mistrust of big business, big corporations. This is, this, is a, this is a big challenge because um, if, we, if we think about vaccinations like polio, mm -hmm. right? Um, the science is solid. And mm -hmm. people back whenever polio you know, the polio back, what was it, the 40s, 50s? I don't remember. Yeah, I think it was late and, 40s, maybe early 50s, yeah. Um, you know, people didn't question the science of that. And it, it's, it's interesting, and, and I don't know yet how technical communicators can intervene in the mistrust to restore trust um, for science, for expertise, I, you know, it, it, that's a complex issue because it is complex. I, I I would like to believe that you know, as as effective communicators, let me let me go Greek on you guys for just a minute here, and you know, go be, become a professor, you know, oh, and so, so a million years ago, <laughs> Aristotle Aristotle was talking about this concept of good and what does good communication or good rhetoric mean, mm -hmm. and it has two senses, right? There's good in the sense of it's effective, it's expedient, it's doing what it needs to do. It's accomplishing its ends. The other aspect of good is it's making the world a better place or at minimum, it's not introducing harm. And so in that, in that frame, the communication that we deliver should be expedient, should be effective, but it also needs to be good. And the good is determined by, you know, a moral compass or how does it impact a certain community or what's in the best interest of people. And I'm not sure that as technical communication faculty, especially, we spend enough time on that second piece of, of the good, mm -hmm. of, the, of you know, the, the moral imperative or what's upright or the ethical piece. And consequently, I think that as our students and, you know, and feel free, those of you out in there in the world to criticize me for this statement, but I'm sure that as we turn people out into the world, they're not as engaged in the ethical thinking about, is this really gonna help the world and make it a better place? Consequently, when someone says, what it is that you do? We say, you know, we, we write policies, procedures, manuals, documents, we, we communicate science so that people can understand it, so people can solve their problems um, or use it for their specific purposes. But we leave off that second half. We leave off that piece where we say, for the good of the community, so that mm -hmm. somebody can accomplish their goals so that their life is better. And I think that's a challenge for us as technical communicators and especially as faculty to add that second piece. So we create effective communication so people can solve their problems so the world is better. It's an entire system. And if um, we think about a lot of the criticisms that are, that are leveled against technical communication, like at my own institution in Colorado, University of Colorado, one of my colleagues in a meeting, one of a hundred and whatever people said, 
Um, your discipline belongs in high school. Sean, you have a PhD in plumbing. Notwithstanding the insult that that implies for people who work using their hands and saying that they're somehow they're less, notwithstanding that, the insult was intended to say, all you do is you're a tool jockey. You're a, you, you know, all you know how to do is to make typefaces pretty. And, you know, in that particular meeting, I, I, I was, I was shocked that somebody would say that, but I think that that's sort of the, the extreme case because we, I are not making a strong enough connection between the, the, the moral, the social, the ethical impact of what effective mm -hmm. communication is and does. That was a long sort of political thing that has nothing to do with water exactly. I'm not sure how I got there. No, it but really, honestly, it does though. The, it does. It's very important. It does because that is looking out for the society, the better of society. And, right? and it, I, it's, yeah. science is not going to do anything without the technical communicator there to bridge that gap for them. That, that should be really evident because you can go blah, blah with all the science you want. But unless you know how to communicate it effectively, no one's going to listen. And, and I think not just communicate it effectively, but communicate about why it's, why it's good, why it's effective, mm -hmm. and the, the, the so what. And so one of my challenges for my, for my own students mm -hmm. is thinking about what is the impact of the world or in the world of these things that you of these things that you create. So if you're working in a UX environment and somebody is asking you to work on a, a web platform that is driving usage of nutraceuticals. Mm -hmm. I have a student right now who's, who's in an internship on this. And we had this conversation yesterday and she said, so all they're asking me to do is to is to get to communicate the science. I'm not sure that that's going to help them as a business. And so I said to the student, it, you know, as you're thinking about how you're helping the business grow, because she's communicating and helping them develop materials, I want you also to think about what the impact is going to be if that business grows. If that business grows, are those nutraceuticals good? I, mm. I don't know. I'm not saying that they're not, but and this is, this is something that I think a lot of us need to think about in terms of um, what it is that we're doing. I, one, of the, one of my sort of moral dilemmas working in Colorado, there's a lot of defense industry here. Tons and tons and tons and tons of defense industry here. Yes. Space Force. Space Force is here. Yeah. Can't say that with a straight face, Space Force. <laughs> um, and so, so Space Force is headquartered here in Colorado Springs. Right. Right. And um, a lot of our students, a lot of technical communicators here write and work in companies that deal with weapons of, I don't call weapons of mass destruction, but huge weapons. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, I have a little bit of a, on one hand, it's like, you know, the, the technology is super cool. I mean, mm -hmm. some of the stuff that I've, I yeah. mean, it's really awesome stuff. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you know, how is it contributing to making the world a better place? And the argument, of course, when I talk to those folks like at L3 Harris or Raytheon or Boeing um, yeah. is, well, you know, we're securing the United States and, and American interests. Okay. Okay. So America is safer. And OPS, when, you know, we're ensuring that things don't hit the International Space Station, you know, because of all the stuff flying around. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, uh, again, the question is, thinking as a technical communicator, not just about communicating the science, but also thinking about the so what, what is, the, what is the impact in the world? And then thinking about connecting that with who are my users? What's the local knowledge? What are their questions? How does the science work with that? And how can I tell stories? How can we tell stories about this stuff that we're talking about? And one of another one of the chapters, actually several of the chapters in, in the book to return to that, actually use narrative methods. And so yeah. as researchers in technical communication, you know, as a faculty member, narrative methods are, are sort of a new thing because we want to be more scientific. And so if people are telling us stories, that's not really scientific. Um, 
And that's not really quality research. But if we think about the power of a narrative or a power of a story, we can learn a lot of things from a story. Yes. Well, it, it, yeah. and it's interesting that you're bringing this up because the narrative is not anything new, but we're now returning to the narrative to understand its impact on cognitive processing and believability, yeah. right? Because stories are very impacting. That's why we, we, we learn stories at a very young age. Parables are nothing new for us, but now yeah. thinking in different terms. So this is again, back to that, you know, the, the, the way to technically mm -hmm. communicate something and through the narrative. And, and this is a challenge, right? Because mm -hmm. can you imagine, can you imagine what a, what a software, man, software manual might look like if it was written as a narrative? <laughs> yeah, as a story. I've seen a few. Well, you know, you can't apply it to everything. <laughs> You're right. I mean, you have to make... use it, you know, it's a tool that, you know, should be used appropriately. You can't apply it to everything. Right. I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of funny sometimes to think about, you know, um, or, you, you know, somebody in Space Force, you know, who's, you know, working on some system and reading a story about something. I don't know. It's just kind, of, just, it's, it's kind of a like funny a a car repair manual and you're, you know, trying to check out your tire pressure, but it's told to you in a parable. <laughs> well, you know, you, you bring up something that's interesting and I'm not sure if you're familiar with car talk. It's an old, yeah. old oh, yeah. NPR show, you know, it's, it's now in, in reruns, but think about those guys, right. And how much knowledge and wisdom they had about cars and think about how they would, they would, or I think about how they would run through a diagnosis and how they would, you know, run, you know, help teach people to how to, you know, what the problem might be. Right, trouble. And, yeah. you know, the, it was it was entertaining, but it was also highly effective. I mean, it was a little bit, yeah. you know, might have taken a long time you know, to get there. And a part of it was entertainment. But think about it in terms of medicine. And um, mm -hmm. one of my friends who's a mm -hmm. medical doctor, mm -hmm. Chris, he said, you know, we don't spend enough time in medical school learning how to understand stories. And I said, well, what do you mean, Chris? He said, well, you know, patients come to me and they describe what's wrong with them in a story. In a story. And so part of my job yeah. as, a, as a medical doctor is picking out the salient details for diagnosis and then telling them a story again about how, you know, to change a behavior, you know, to, to treat diabetes or, or whatever. Right. And he said, so part of my job, his job as a doctor is telling stories back to people after I've interpreted their stories. So he's dealing with scientific knowledge. And so I wonder how, how, you know, technical communicators can think about using stories. Yes. And especially if we're talking about things like environmental justice, environmental action. Yeah. So it's, yeah. And it's, I think that field, I think environmental justice, environmental action is really rich, fertile ground for storytelling more than any, I think, you know, maybe I'm biased, but I think more than any other discipline, I think that area is more fertile ground for storytelling because it's really important to tell those stories to the people that are going to understand them and interpret the stories in their language, right? In their cultural language. Right. Right. And um, thanks everyone for sticking around. I, I apologize for arriving late. I, I, um, I lost, I lost the link. So that's, that's on me, the, the professor. No, no, I should have sent it. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, the, the challenge also with stories though, is thinking about not making them sensational. Right. Right. And so let, let's think yes. about, let's think about media and I'm not going to jump on the let's criticize Boy. media bandwagon, but all right. So somebody's house, we had a fire here in Boulder, um, Colorado, a month ago or so, you know, and so this little fire started, little, little wildfire started, huge winds came up and burned down neighborhoods in Boulder, like what happened in, in Northern California a few years ago right. in paradise and so on. And, you know, it's, that's a terrible tragedy. Mm. Lots of people were devastated by that. And what we have to be careful of is making the story so good that it becomes abusive of the people who are suffering. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a, you know, again, coming back to ethics and the ethical imperative of technical communication. Yes, I can create a story that's going to make me have 
have really strong impact on people. And I can do that by, you know, sensationalizing one victim, one yeah. survivor. Mm-hmm. But is that really the best choice? Is that right. what I should be doing? Right. Um, and again, you know, we can talk about whether broadcast media are doing that or, or sensationalizing people suffering for benefit. Right. I hope, well, that, I hope that technical communicators don't. And there's the whole thing about sensationalism and desensitizing people. So, you know, yeah. you know that's a slippery slope. I agree with you. It is. So how do you, how do you create impact, but do it in a way that's rational, that is controlled. Um, and you might be able to intuit a little bit by my personality. I'm, I'm a pretty energetic person. And <laughs> yeah. And, and so, and so it's, and so it's easy for me, you know, like in a, in a setting, like when I'm in classes or when I'm talking to friends or I'm talking to people that I work with out in industry to get very passionate about this and get on my, my high horse about ethics and, um, you know, yeah. all this, but then at the same time, part of our job as technical communicators is to get stuff done. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we have to think about that too, not right. just the ethical imperatives, because we can get into, we can paralyze ourselves. Mm-hmm. And so anyway, is there a question? over? Funny, there? honestly, the best keynote I ever saw at a conference was an ethicist from Emory at the AMO, at the medical writers conference. And mm-hmm. he was talking about, it's really important that we are ethical and we communicate because this is some of the science is right on the edge and it's important and it's going to change the world, how we deal with it and see it in the future. So, yeah, I think that's our key. I want to thank Paul for, for bringing up the word empathy in the chat Mm -hmm. because um, that's key. And actually in my own program here in Colorado, university of Colorado, we actually now have a required course in um, we don't call it empathy. We call it, it's 40, 60, it's, you know, diverse perspectives, but it's an empathy uh, class. It's empathy, yeah. It's an empathy and emotional intelligence class. Mm-hmm. And we, we spend a lot of time connecting that to UX, to ethics, because mm-hmm. as you say, it all starts with empathy. And if we don't understand as effective communicators, the, the people who are out there, we don't understand what the impact could be of what we do, mm-hmm. then maybe, maybe we're not good people. And well, um, I think, I think part of one of the skill sets to practice and always be learning as a technical communicator is empathic skills, right? And it's one of those things that it might not come naturally to everybody, but always studying and researching and learning about empathy and empathic skills, um, I think is important. Well, and, and I think that it's um, it's increasingly important. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I, I think as things become, like you said, you know, more charged and that sensationalism and the mistrust and distrust out there, I think that really is like a, a big, huge red flashing light for all of us in professional and technical communication to pay extra attention to our our skills and empathy. And to help yeah. and to help pull that into the science community and to the business community and wherever you are, because ethics, ethics is an interesting argument, right? And you have companies that have different flavor of ethics, right? It's ethical from their business perspective, from the business that they're in. So I think that that's the one thing when you pull in empathy into that factor, and then you apply it to the, the ethics of that business, and then you can help you know, propel things and move things forward yeah. towards, you know, more compassionate towards society as a whole. Anyways, this has been, been, this has been amazing. Great conversation. <laughs> I, we should just keep going. I think I, yes, I so enjoy talking to you and I appreciate you coming. Yeah. Invite me back. Yes. You bet. Yes. I've already got an idea for something. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, no, definitely. I always reserve the right to bring you back. 
<laughs> right. And we'll post a link to your book once it's yeah. uh, once it's available on the show page. So everybody yeah. be sure to get there when it comes in, in October. Yeah. Yes. Yep. We'll have the live link on your show. Page. I know. I want that chapter. There's two chapters, three or four oh, chapters. Okay. I don't know the whole thing. Actually, the whole book. <laughs> I know. I'm looking forward to it. I Thank really you. Am. And I really appreciate your time um, with us today. Oh, absolutely. I know you are tremendously busy. So. I appreciate the invitation. And thanks to everybody out there in Cyberland for, for tuning in. Yes. Thanks, thanks everybody. Until thanks, the next Thanks, everyone. Take, Take care. care.